Sometimes around here you've got to tear up the script, and uh, that's what we're going to do today. Um, not being previously aware of the breadth and depth uh, of the problems that are about to be revealed here today, um, I'm changing the order of the witnesses because I want the principals who are involved in shaping federal policy or implementing federal policy in these areas to hear the testimony, which is going to be absolutely devastating. You know, I've been very critical of uh, Mexican trucks uh, coming across the border and raised a host of safety issues. And among the issues I've raised is the lack of certified drug testing facilities in Mexico. Well, it turns out here in the United States of America, we have no meaningful program of drug testing for commercial truck drivers, none. We're going to hear that today. The collection facilities are easily penetrated with false licenses. The facilities themselves, you can easily, easily smuggle in devices that are readily available on the internet, which we'll hear about a little later today. The FMCSA uh, has been aware of this. Uh, and they, in fact, say in their testimony that, yes, they weren't in the GAO, in response to GAO. No, they weren't shocked at all to learn that these testing facilities were loophole-ridden and providing uh, tests that were, whose results were uh, easily uh, modified and made uh, meaningless. But they've sent out posters. We're going to hear testimony that there's a 2004 report about the problem with job hopping. So even when this faulty system works, which we don't know how many people are out there abusing substances, most conservative estimate, 1.7 percent. Everybody agrees on that, at least 1.7 percent. That's 170,000 truck drivers driving 80,000 pound trucks abusing drugs. In Oregon, with a random test, it seems like maybe the number is five times higher. We don't know. There's no meaningful system. None. This is shocking. This is incredibly shocking stuff. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to proceed in, in a, in a little, different, little different manner today. So we're going to have people listen to the people who are doing the investigations and a person representing an organization who's been critical of the system. And then we'll have the other witnesses. And then I will hope for meaningful responses from the administrator and uh, the person representing SAMHSA. Because this cries out for action. And if you lack legal authority to implement the program that your 2004 report said you needed to do to take care of job hopping, tell us. But you don't say it in your testimony. You're just saying, well, yeah, we got that report in 2004. We're still thinking about how we might have a national database so that when you have a drug abusing truck driver who doesn't complete treatment, it goes to another trucking company and starts driving again. We have no idea, except in the state of North Carolina and a few other places who have taken steps that we could take nationally to prevent that from happening, prevent people from being killed because they're drug abusing truck drivers out there. Mr. Duncan. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. This is a very appropriate uh, subject about which to hold a uh, hearing, and I thank you for calling this uh, hearing today. The <coughs> safety of uh, truck and bus drivers on our nation's highways is a major concern for this uh, committee and subcommittee. We know that a driver's uh, health can significantly affect his ability to drive safely while on the road with other trucks, buses, passenger cars, and pedestrians. Recent news reports have called truck and bus driving safety into question particularly with respect to driving while under the influence of drugs. In response, this committee um, uh, has exercised its oversight responsibility to review policies regarding drug testing of truck, of truck drivers. We want to know if there is actually a problem with drug use and drug testing in the trucking industry. Only when we get an accurate picture of this issue and its severity can we determine effective measures to address it. A DOT study on the causes of truck crashes uh, found that brake problems, speeding, and driver fatigue are the most common factors cited as causes. Uh, illegal drug usage uh, w was cited uh, uh, as being an associated factor in 2 percent of truck crashes. There are, there are 711,000 commercial motor carriers, uh, carriers registered by the Federal Motor Carrier Administration. Uh, this translates to more than 4 million individuals who have uh, been issued a commercial driver's license. 
FMCSA is charged with uh, regulating the safety of all commercial motor vehicles engaging in interstate commerce. The agency must focus its attention on policies and actions that will reap the greatest safety benefit. Looking to other Department of Transportation agencies like FAA, FTA, or FRA for a drug and alcohol testing program structure uh, really uh, uh, is probably not going to work. The trucking industry needs a safety oversight and enforcement program that fits the unique needs and size of the industry it regulates. We have to keep our eye on the main objective protecting our citizens from unsafe drivers and vehicles. Our policy and funding decisions should be focused on the activities that will do this the most effectively. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing, and I look forward to hearing the testimony. I thank the gentleman. I'd uh, turn to uh, Mr. Oberstar, the uh, chair of the full committee. Mr. DeFazio, uh, Chairman, I, I share your anger, your frustration, and your uh, fury at uh, the state of drug and alcohol testing. In the, uh, in the United States, especially in the light of the efforts this committee has made on Mexican trucks and drivers and drug testing and the inadequacy of their program, but to find that ours falls so grossly short is, as you put it, uh, shocking uh, and, 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 and makes one angry. This committee played a significant role in the 1980s in shaping the uh, drug and alcohol uh, testing rules that were put in place in the late 80s. But there hasn't been any oversight over whether those, worlds, whether those rules are working and how they're working and who is being caught and how the tests are being avoided. The number of commercial drivers using drugs by official record has gone down. But the rules aren't working. They aren't working as well as they should. We know that drivers are still using drugs, but getting away with it, that's the serious problem. Now, this is not a hearing about morality of drug use. It's not about the character of the people who are using the drugs. It's about breaking the law, avoiding the law, skillfully using the Internet to get around the law. It's about safety, about lives on the highways. Commercial motor carrier account for 13 percent of highway deaths a year. Illegal drugs, so far as is known, account for a small percentage of those crashes. But as Mr. DeFazio said, even at 1 percent, that's 110 plus thousand, maybe as many as 200,000 deaths. I mean, uh, I mean uh, incidents, drivers. We know what the effects of cocaine, marijuana, and speed use are upon driving. They impair the driver's ability to conduct that vehicle. That's one thing to go to a, a pop concert and, and use those drugs. But it's something else to use them and get behind the wheel of an 80,000-pound vehicle. This committee takes that seriously. Fox News outlet in uh, Minneapolis uh, in February of this year conducted an investigation of drug testing facilities on some tips that they received. Sites where urine is collected, where what they found shocked them about the integrity of the tests. The Fox reporter wasn't required to empty his pockets. He was sent to a public restroom that other building tenants had access to. The restroom wasn't searched first to make sure that nothing had been hidden there to help him mask the tests. Collectors who are not following protocols, facilities that don't meet federal requirements, create an opportunity, an opening for drug users to escape detection. And they will jump on the opportunity in athletics as well as in driving. The Health and Human Services Department in 2005 issued a guidance to collectors to uh, try to deal with the cheating problem. Now they said, a drug user who is part of a workplace drug testing program will most likely try to defeat the drug test if given the opportunity. Well, <laughs> that's human nature. 
what Fox News found, what GAO is going to tell us today, is that there is plenty of opportunity. And there are products out there to make it possible to cheat. Over 400 products, gadgets, to help a drug user beat the drug test. Products that can be added to a urine sample to mask the drug, to dilute the urine sample. Even synthetic urine, I was stunned to find out, virtually indistinguishable from hu human urine. With products like Whizzy's Urine Luck, play on words, play on the sound of words, and stealth. They're sold on websites called PassYourDrugTest.com, OneHourDetox.com, Whizinator.com. Committee investigators from our committee found human urine for sale on Craigslist, adulterants available on eBay, Adulterants available on Amazon. I thought you could only buy books from Amazon. These products are sold with the specific intent of defeating a drug test. There is no other use, no other beneficial use for those products. They ought to be banned. And I hope one of the outcomes of this hearing will be legislation to do exactly that. And Health and Human Services admits that their tests don't pick up these products. And when they do, guess what? The manufacturers simply change the formula. It's a cat and mouse game. Manufacturers staying one step ahead of the testing labs. Because the products fool the labs, there's no way of knowing how widespread the cheating is. That is one of the revealing, shocking messages of and findings of the GAO report, because they don't know how many drivers are cheating. The regulatory agencies can't tell how many drivers are using drugs. The Motor Carrier Safety Administration estimates 2 percent of drivers test positive, but there are other studies that suggest a much higher number. In Oregon, state police conducted two operations last spring and this fall, where they anonymously tested 400 drivers. They found illegal drugs in nearly 10 percent of truck drivers. Health and Human Services published their uh, occupational drug use survey, finding a 7.4 percent of heavy truck drivers reported they had used illegal drugs in the prior month. But at 2 percent, that's 200,000 drivers. If only half of those uh, were using, there are still 100,000 drivers on the roads indefensible, unacceptable. And then there's another loophole. Drivers who have been caught using drugs can keep on driving without going through the rehab process. In May 1999, a bus taking 43 passengers, uh, carrying 43, it crashed in New Orleans, killing 22 passengers and the driver tested positive for marijuana. Tragedy was it could have been prevented. When the company hired the driver, they didn't know the driver had failed four prior drug tests, two for which he was fired. Getting a job applicant's prior drug history re re relies on self-reporting. <laughs> That's not good enough. There are no alternative sources from which employers can get that history. And there are drug-using drivers that are able to jump from job to job and leaving their drug use history behind. Now, the uh, uh, Tour de France last year was uh, widely uh, criticized for, for drug use by cyclists, but they were all caught. There is a rigorous program of testing bicyclists by the World Anti-Doping Agency in the U.S anti-doping agency. They follow the cyclists into the testing place, into the bathroom. They stand there while the urine sample is delivered. They take blood tests. Now, we have all these privacy laws that say you can't do that sort of thing. But there are other ways to deal with it, and we're going to explore those in the course of this hearing, and we're not going to just leave it there. We're going to follow up with action by this committee under the uh, Vigorous leadership, Chairman DeFazio. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, Mr. Chairman, just on one remark you made. Uh, it's not just that the manufacturers get ahead of the tests, uh, and I will be asking about the rationale for this because it's unfathomable to me, but Health and Human Services is apparently required to publish the list of adulterants and the tests developed for them in the Federal Register so that the manufacturers are able to change their formulas and prevent detection. Uh, that one's way beyond me, so that'll be another topic I hope we cover. With that, uh, we will turn uh, to our first panel of witnesses, and as I say, we have uh, gotten off the script here because I, I, this is so extraordinary, and I do want and hope that the uh, when the administrator uh, uh, testifies uh, later and the acting director of uh, the Office of Drug and Alcohol uh, Policy and Compliance who's with him and uh, the person representing uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, I'd urge you to take notes and depart from your prepared testimony because you're going to need to. Uh, so with that, I would turn uh, first uh, to uh, Mr. Gregory D. Cutts, uh, Managing Director, Forensic Audits and Special Investigations, USGAO. Mr. Cutts. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss drug testing for commercial truck drivers. Recent reports of drivers operating with controlled substances in their system raise serious questions about the safety of our nation's highways. Today's testimony highlights our covert testing of the DOT drug testing program. My testimony has two parts. First, I will discuss what we did, and second, I will discuss what we found. First, we created two fictitious companies and selected 24 publicly advertised urine collection sites that follow DOT protocols. These sites are located in Los Angeles, Dallas-Fort Worth, New York, New Jersey, and the Washington, D.C. areas. We also produced 24 bogus commercial driver's licenses for 24 fictitious individuals from the states of Washington, Georgia, West Virginia, and Delaware. Using bogus licenses, we visited these 24 sites posing as drivers selected by our fictitious companies to take a drug test. At these sites, we tested 16 key DOT protocols designed to prevent an employee from beating a drug test. We also purchased synthetic urine and adulterants on the internet and used these products for eight of our tests. Moving on to the results of our work, we found breakdowns in all phases of the drug testing program. I have in my hand one of the 24 bogus driver's licenses that we used for this test. We produced this West Virginia driver's license using commercially available hardware, software, and materials. We use licenses just like this one to gain access to all 24 sites to take our drug test. This clearly shows that a drug user could send someone else in their place to take a drug test. With respect to protocols, 22 of the 24 sites that we visited failed at least two of the 16 DOT protocols that we tested. For example, 75% of the sites failed to secure the facility from substances that could be used to adulterate or dilute the specimen. The first poster board and the pictures on the monitor on both sides of me show pictures we took at one of the collection sites with our cell phone cameras. Notice in the first picture the potential adulterants such as Lysol outside of the collection area. The second picture shows the same Lysol container which our investigator took into the collection area and could have easily used to adulterate his urine. We also found that products designed to beat a drug test are widely available for sale on the internet. The next poster board shows some of the marketing pitches that are used to sell these products. As you can see, these products are represented to be safe, undetectable, and guaranteed to beat a DOT or other drug test. 
we were able to easily bring these products into all eight of the sites that we tested for them. For example, I have in my hand one of the bottles and heating pads that we used to carry synthetic urine into the collection area. We also used vials like the one I have in my hand to carry adulterants into the collection area. None of the eight synthetic or adulterated urine samples that we provided were detected by the labs. Uh, Mr. Kutz, I want to interrupt you at that point. Sure. Uh, uh, are you able to identify the authors of those uh, comments? On the poster board there? Yes. I don't have that with me, but they were there were. But you do have that sites. information. We could get that for you if you're Submit interested. Submit that for the record, please. Certainly. And Mr. Chairman, we do have some slides that I was going to have the staff put up later, which actually show some of these websites and the advertisements. Yeah. No, we do have that, but yes. I wanted about these particular comments. We could submit that for you. Yes, sir. In conclusion, our covert testing clearly shows that a drug user could easily beat the DOT drug test. Even if the collection sites followed all of the DOT protocols, our work shows that the test can be beaten using counterfeit documents, synthetic urine, or adulterants. Addressing the vulnerabilities that I've just discussed will require substantial improvements in all phases of the drug testing program. Mr. Chairman, that ends my statement. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, with that, I turn to Catherine. Hopefully I'll get it right. Sigurd? Yes, okay. Uh, Director of the Physical Infrastructure Team, uh, U.S. Uh, GAO. Ms. Sigurd. Chairman Obersar, Chairman DeFazio, rank Ranking Member Duncan, and members of the subcommittee, we appreciate your invitation to appear at this hearing on drug testing of drivers employed in safety-sensitive positions in the motor carrier industry. My colleague, Mr. Coos, has described the significant problems existing at collection sites that are an important component of FMCSA's drug testing program. Our ongoing work for this subcommittee and the chairman of the full committee raises issues about compliance, accountability, and design of additional aspects of the drug testing program. My statement presents these preliminary results today and will focus on challenges in, first, overseeing and enforcing compliance with drug testing regulations, and second, ensuring the integrity of the drug tests and the processes for keeping drivers with identified problems off the roads. Before getting to these results, it is useful to provide some background on the program itself. As shown in this slide and in the packets you have in front of you, drug testing is a multi-step process that includes many players. Employers must, of course, design and implement a program or hire a third party to do it for them. In addition, FMCSA provides regulation and oversight. Collection sites obtain the specimens. Laboratories test the specimens under the oversight of the Department of Health and Human Services. Medical review officers review and verify lab results and report them to employers and substance abuse professionals design programs for employees that wish to return to driving after a positive test. With regard to FMCSA's efforts to ensure that commercial motor carriers have drug testing programs in place, we found that noncompliance appears to be widespread. According to FMCSA data, more than 70% of compliance reviews conducted since 2001 and more than 40% of safety audits conducted since 2003 found violations of drug testing regulations, including finding that the carrier has no drug testing program at all. As shown here, the most frequently cited drug testing violations in compliance reviews are carriers having employed drivers without a pre-employment drug test or not testing them at all. About 1% of compliance reviews find that carriers allow drivers with a positive drug test to continue to drive. Noncompliance appears to be particularly high among small carriers and owner operators. In addition, FMCSA's oversight is limited. While new entrance safety audits are designed to reach all new entrants, compliance reviews only reach about 2% of carriers each year due, the, due to the size of the industry and resources devoted to these activities. In particular, oversight activities do not address compliance by agents used by carriers to implement drug testing programs, such as collection sites, because of limited resources and the lack of enforcement authority. FMCSA will investigate service agents, such as collection sites, as a result of a specific complaint, but can only act to disqualify them from DOT's testing programs, rather than using the fines that can be applied to motor carriers. Even when there is good compliance with the regulations, drivers who use drugs may still be driving commercial motor vehicles. First, as Mr. Coots explained, Subversion of the drug test is still possible. 
The regulations do not require directly observed collection, nor do they require a thorough search for hidden subversion products. The extent to which subversion is occurring is unknown and is impossible to determine because when specimens are successfully adulterated or substituted, there is no record which would allow us to judge this extent. Second, there are limitations to the, to the, drug, to the test itself. Drivers who use illegal substances other than the five that DOT tests for, those are amphetamines, cocaine, operate, uh, excuse me, opiates, marijuana, and PCP, or who use certain prescription medications may not be identified. Also, the urine test does not provide indications of drug use history because it can only detect the presence of drugs taken within the previous several days. Finally, lack of disclosure of past positive drug tests is a problem. DOT regulations require that an employer, in addition to testing a job applicant, inquire about that applicant's drug test history and contact the driver's recent employers. Representatives, representatives from several motor carriers told us it is easy for drivers to simply omit any previous employer for whom they tested positive or any such pre-employment drug test. Such drivers can remain drug free for a period of time leading up to their next pre-employment test, get, get a negative result and get hired without their new employer knowing about any past positive tests. In our ongoing work, we are analyzing options for addressing some of these problems, including their costs, advantages and disadvantages. These include publicizing information and successful practices regarding drug, drug testing requirements to carriers, service agents, and drivers, improving and expanding FMC oversight and enforcement, adopting federal legislation prohibiting the sale, manufacturer, or use of adulterants or substitutes, testing for more and different drugs, testing alternative specimens, and developing a national reporting requirement for past positive drug test results. We will be issuing our report to the committee in May and I will take any questions uh, when the committee is ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we would now turn to uh, <coughs> Dr. Smith. Go ahead. My name is Dr. Donna Smith, and I represent... A little bit, Dr. Smith, yeah. That better? Okay. My name is Donna Smith. I represent today before you the Substance Abuse Program Administrators Association, which is a nonprofit professional group that uh, has as its members DOT regulated employers and service agents who assist them and support them in implementing and conducting uh, workplace drug and alcohol testing programs. In preparation for my being here today, the organization did conduct a survey, a very uh, thorough survey of its membership to explore the problems that uh, the committee is, is addressing. We also held a recent conference where this particular topic was uh, discussed and where more data was provided. So as a summary of that, I'd like to present that there are probably three main things that I believe and that the association believes are uh, roadblocks to being able to effectively implement uh, the Department of Transportation's drug and alcohol testing program and to achieve its objectives of deterrence, the detection of illegal drug use among safety sensitive workers. And those three things my colleagues here today have already mentioned. One is obviously that there are opportunities to cheat on the drug test and very, very uh, little opportunity to detect that cheating. Secondly is that when the rules have been successful in identifying an individual who tests positive or who refuses to test through an adulterated or substituted drug test, uh, by our best estimates, 40, only 40% 40 of those go through any kind of rehabilitation uh, intervention or return to duty efforts. Now, other people would say that, well, that's a good thing, it's working. They aren't working in transportation anymore or they aren't driving a truck anymore. I am not at all convinced that that is true. The third thing that I think is the uh, greatest uh, impediment to the success of the Department of Transportation's drug and alcohol testing regulations is uh, a real difficulty in implementing effective compliance monitoring. And that is particularly uh, true in the commercial motor carrier industry. And I would like to take just a couple of more minutes to explain in some depth what some of the things that I think are critical. 
having to do with collection sites. When I worked for five years at the U.S. Department of Transportation at the time that the Omnibus Act was, was being implemented and the regulations were uh, being promulgated, we always said then that we knew that the collection of the specimen was going to be the weakest link in the process. We, we had a lot of tools to address the analytical issues in the laboratories. We had a lot of issues, ways that we could address issues in terms of the training and the expertise of the physicians who would review and interpret test results. The mere scope of specimen collection for potentially hundreds of thousands of employers is mind-boggling. Our estimate in our associations that there are probably at least 10,000 collection sites that service DOT-regulated employers across the U.S. These are laboratory patient service centers. These are urgent care centers. They're doctor's offices. They're chiropractor's offices. They are whatever. In almost all cases, collecting a forensic urine drug sample is not their core business. And in almost all cases, this task is entrusted to the lowest paid, least trained member of that staff. So I think just getting our hands around that is difficult. In terms of the return to duty process and people that circumvent that, and I think it may be as high as 50,000 people that we have caught on the drug test, but that who do not go through the return to duty process, I think that we need to look seriously at the opportunity for uh, a national database. The U.S. Coast Guard, the Federal Aviation Administration, and to some extent the Federal Railroad Administration have been much more successful because they are able to rescind or revoke licenses or documents, and people therefore cannot work in that industry again until they have been able to satisfy the return to duty requirements. So in short, the recommendations to the committee from SAPA are as follows, that Congress support and pass some form of the Drug Testing Integrity Act to try to get a handle on the proliferation of the adulterants and the other products so readily available, that they would follow what six states have tried to do, and of course the uh, purveyors of these products simply get around that by having ads on their website. We can't ship to you in North Carolina, but we can ship it to a friend or family member in any of the neighboring states. So I think we need a national piece of legislation, Mr. Chairman. I think that we also need to increase funding and resources for the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. The ratio of auditor or inspector to carrier is abysmal. But we have to make those more than paper audits, more than an auditor or an inspector going on in and saying, let me see your statistical report for the year, let me see your written policy. The inspectors must be trained and they must be held to go out into the field to do the kind of collections that Mr. Kurtz's organization did in terms of seeing what is going on. I also believe that the development somehow of a national database is essential to stop the job hopping. You've got an industry where turnover rate, where availability of drivers really drives and encourages the process of being able to walk out of one trucking company or motor carrier and go down the road to the next. And finally, I think that the Department of Transportation needs to more effectively wield a club and a tool that it already has in place in the regulations, which is the public interest exclusionary process so that when collection sites or when third-party administrators or when medical review officers flagrantly disregard the requirements that are already there in the rule, that they are, in fact, posted as this, this service agent cannot do business with a DOT-regulated employer. Thank you for your time and your attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'd now uh, go for a... Uh round of questions. First, a couple of questions from websites. If I could see the slide that says, this one claims government endorsement. Um, could the GAO comment on that? It says, we carry FDA-approved drug test detoxification programs for passing serious drug tests. All of our products are manufactured in, in, our, in the U.S. I 
course, support manufactured in the U.S., but <laughs> uh, located DHS and DEA certified facilities. Can you, can you comment? Can, do you have any comment or insight into that claim? I don't, certainly. Yeah. No. no. I don't either. Okay. How about then the favorite links from a DAT testing facility website slide? Uh, next, no, not the Wizenator. Yeah, here we go, last one. Um, this is from a lab called, uh, uh, I think it's blacked out. They're in California. Some of the specifics are blacked out, and I don't know why. Uh, I'd love to publish their name right now, but I'll get it later. It's something healthcare clinic, Comus, California. And uh, they ad administer commercial truck driver medical exams and drug testing. And they have a favorite links. We all like our favorite links. And their favorite link is to, could we have the next slide, please? Insider's Guide to Passing a Drug Test, What the Labs Don't Want You to Know. This is on the website of a company that is certified to do commercial drug driver medical exams and drug testing. Well, I think, uh, Chairman DeFazio, clearly that's a problem. And, and we've, we've all made the case today here that these adulterants and substitutes are, are not regulated except by a few states, and that there is an issue with oversight of these collection facilities. It's not surprising, therefore, to see a, a collection facility website that would have, shall we say, questionable information on it. I think, Dr. Smith, this might go to your uh, comment about the exclusionary process or the disqualification process. I think maybe a company that's doing medical exams and drug testing that has a favorite link on how to beat the tests, you think they ought to be doing these tests? No, sir, and I think that is the point. It's just like what I think we've been through as a, as a country in terms of how did we get OSHA compliance. There has to be, there has to be some kind of a a threat, a risk assessment that every employer, every company is going to go through in terms of what may happen if I don't comply. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's been difficult. <clears throat> uh, I think one of the fears, Mr. Chairman, and I, I know this was true when I was at the Department of Transportation, is if we rode these people too hard, then they'll simply say, okay, I'm not gonna do drug testing anymore. All right, DOT drug testing. It's not a big part of my revenue anyway. And you know what? I don't even care if I do the DOT physicals. I'm only getting 25 or 35 bucks for those. You know, so that's okay. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that, and, and the concern was, all right, then we're simply going to make it harder for a commercial motor carrier to comply because they're not going to have very many places that they can send this driver for that random test when he's between moose breath and wherever. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, in the, uh, the testimony uh, by Mr. Cutts, on page 20 you say here, corrective action briefing. We briefed the DOT on the results of our investigation on October 1st, 2007. DOT officials agreed with our findings and indicated they were not surprised by the results of our work, stating that they have performed similar tests themselves in prior years with similar results. Do you stand by that? They actually said that? Yes, we give corrective action briefings all the time. Our protocols are first to brief your staff, and then we go to the agencies affected and brief them, and we document what they say to us, and that's correct. And then it says here their response was they developed posters. That's what it says, yes. Uh, are the posters required to be posted in these facilities? I don't, believe I don't believe they're required. We did see one of the best practices was one of the places that followed all the protocols actually did have posters up there. So that certainly was one of the better things we did see, and we didn't see many good things. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, they also said that the Real ID Act could close a vulnerability identified using fake driver's licenses. My recollection, and you can help me out with this, on the Real ID Act is I, I believe state compliance is required in 09 or 10, and then states are not required uh, until a person's license is reissued to uh, provide a Real ID capable 
uh, license, which could be in some states as long as 10 years. So we could be looking at 2020. It's a long term. That's a long term clear. Right. Right. Yes. Agreed. Okay. And they didn't seem disturbed by the fact that you were able to successfully penetrate all these facilities with fake driver's licenses today? I think they were, but they didn't really offer a short-term solution. I think that's something we can talk about at the hearing today. Are there short-term solutions to that issue? And what would, they, what would those be? Well, we've talked about two possibilities. Either the employer faxing a copy of identification to the test sites of the person coming to take the test, or actually the test site making copies of the credentials that were given to them for the person taking the test and making sure that those go back to the employer so the employer makes sure that the person who took the test is in fact their person. That could be a short-term, low-cost alternative. Okay. We'll be asking the administrator uh, if he would like to do that. Um, I, I have a, a question about, I mean, part of the problem is uh, with the drug testing is it's obviously ephemeral. And there's some discussion about hair and other things. Is hair testing accurate for historic uh, drug use, which might then give us probable cause to target more testing on that person? Can anybody comment on that? I, I can comment on that simply by the in, involvement that I've had with, with clients that utilize hair testing. Does it give a longer window of detection for illegal drug use depending on the length of hair sample? The answer to that question is yes. Is it reliable? Uh, I think, again, there are, the, the science is uh, divided on that. It certainly is analytically reliable. I think you have questions about whether or not single time or, quote, recreational use is as easily detected in terms of absorption into the hair as you do people who are chronic or frequent users. I think you also have some of the issues with regard to the availability of sample, you know, depending on where on the body you can get sufficient hair. So from a reliability, et cetera. I think, though, the thing to, um, that would address some of the issues that we are having here is, and I'm sure that Mr. Stevenson and Dr. Bush from, from SAMHSA will back me up, that since hair testing has begun to proliferate more in the non-regulated drug testing world, if that is employers doing drug tests un not under federal authority of any kind, we have seen the products, the ads, and whatever increase over 300% for shampoos, for um, uh, hair preparations that you would put on your hair to pass your hair test mm -hmm. if your employer has gone to that. We have had, I have had collectors who have been trained how to snip the hair and package the hair contact me because people are showing up with weaves and with human hair wigs yeah. and all kinds of things. So I don't want right. you to think that by changing specimens, no, we I, can I, necessarily... That's not exactly where I was going. Where I was going was that the hair test, since it's not real time and there is some potential dispute, could be used as an indicator to give us probable cause to target that individual for more frequent urinalysis or a higher, you know, something along those lines. Well, and I Not think necessarily a disqualification, but say, well, you know, we notice you have been, the test shows you've been using drugs in the past. That means you're going to be subjected to, you know, more frequent random testing. And I can tell you that I have seen that used in other programs that I have um, been involved with, particularly in the area of monitoring healthcare professionals who have had their licenses rescinded right. for... Um, you know, for, for mm -hmm. substance okay. abuse. Then one other, yeah. Chairman Fazio, we will be looking at these alternative specimens uh, in, our long, in our work, in our report that will be issued in May. Let me just mention a couple things to keep in mind about them. I think part of it is we need to decide what it is we're trying to accomplish. Are we looking for that long-term use or are we looking for recent use? The urine is useful for recent use. The hair is use, useful for longer-term use. Uh, we have talked with motor carriers who are using a hair testing as part of a pre-employment test for that very reason, mm -hmm. and then also using urine testing. Um, the other issue to keep in mind is, 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 of course, what Dr. Smith brought up. In deciding to go a different direction in this area, we need to look at the potential 
to address the two problems that, that uh, Mr. Coots found, and that is the ability to substitute or adulterate, and whether the industry that, that assists with that will sort of ramp up and be responsive to a new testing sure, approach. That goes to that requirement of, uh, do you, are you familiar with this requirement that DHSS publish a roadmap on how to beat the system? And can you tell me what the possible rationale for that is? Uh, DHS, D DHHS does, uh, in fact, uh, publish in the Federal Register protocols for testing and ranges within which uh, testing will be done. My understanding is that is a federal requirement. Dr. Smith may have some more to say about that. I would defer that, I think, for when Mr. Stevenson is okay. here. He can tell you exactly the uh, circumstance under which that has okay. to be published. We, we may want to. And then finally, on the, um, the job hopping, uh, which was raised, uh, and the issue of a federal registry. I mean, we had a report in 2004, and from reviewing the FMCSA testimony, it seems like they're thinking about it. Is that sort of the extent of where we're at here? They're kind of thinking about it? I mean, it, this is an identified problem. Uh, I mean, did you have any discussions with FMCSA about the national database and the need for one and the job hopping problem? Yes, we have had uh, discussions with FMCSA, and in our ongoing work, we also do plan to go to those states that have a registry already. Uh, there are a number of them across the country, and two states that actually uh, not only require reporting, but connect that then to the uh, provision of the CDL. Um, you know, a number, number of issues to be addressed there. Clearly, the uh, registry would, ad would address two problems. One would be the job hopping issue. The other would be uh, helping employers to comply with the requirement that they do check the previous drug, drug history. The registry addresses both of those. Clearly, in setting it up, there are a number of things to think about. Uh, the resources that would need to be devoted uh, to the registry in order to make sure that it is timely uh, and accurate. And then another question of whether at the federal level you want to make the connection to the CDL the way a few of the states are doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll look forward to your further thoughts on that. Uh, I do have the full name now. It's the it's the Ross Healthcare Clinic in uh, Commerce, California. Uh, great citizens, and we might want to have uh, FMCSA consider whether they want these people to still continue to be eligible uh, to apply uh, to do uh, medical exams and drug testing, given their advocacy for beating the drug tests. And that isn't an advertisement for this company. Uh, thank you. I turn now to the ranking member, Mr. Duncan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Sigurd, um, you, you say in your statement that um, DOT estimates that approximately 4.2 million people, including truck and bus drivers, work in such positions, in other words, commercial driving, and that commercial motor carriers account for less than 5% of all highway crashes. But these crashes result in about 13 percent of all highway deaths, or about 5,500 of the approximately 43,000 highway uh, annual highway fat uh, fatalities. A DOT study on the factors associated with large truck crashes finds that vehicle factors such as brake problems and behavioral factors such as speeding and driver fatigue are some of the most frequently cited factors involved in large truck crashes, while illegal drug usage is not among the most frequently cited factors appearing as an associated factor in only 2 percent of the crashes, which everybody would agree is 2 percent too many. But do you, uh, uh, I just wonder, do, uh, do you think that, uh, do you have faith in that DOT study or, or in your investigation of this, do you have any reason to question that? Uh, do, do you think that 2 percent figure is accurate? I'm just trying to learn the extent of the problem here. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to think about that, uh, Mr. Duncan, but, but let me just make a, a few That's a great, Just points. pull the mic down sure. just a I'm little sorry. bit. We, sure. We'll hear you. Uh, it, it certainly is true that, that the study, and, and the, this is a long-term crash causation study, it's an ongoing study uh, that, that was uh, done to investigate crashes post hoc, and it is very comprehensive. You it said it's a, a long-term study? It's called the Long-Term crash, crash Causation How Study. How long has it been going on? I, I would I have to get that to you uh, for the anyway, record, Mr. Duncan. it's been several years. Yes, it has. Right. And, and the idea of it is it goes out in two crashes and investigates a number of factors related right. to them after the crash. Um, it, it does, of course, identify that equipment failure and behavior problems are a very significant causes of, of crashes. And, of course, this committee's looked at those issues in other hearings. Um, 
With regard to the amount of illegal drug use going, though, and its, and its uh, contribution to crashes, um, we really don't know very well what the actual percentage is of drivers that are using drugs. You know, the, the bottom number is certainly the 2 percent that FMCSA identifies. The upper bound may be somewhere around the 10 percent that hair testing and other testing has shown. So it's fairly difficult to know exactly what the causes are. Um, another part of that long-term crash causation study did say, however, that there's no doubt that illegal drug use does increase the uh, likelihood and the risk of a crash occurring. I'm told by staff that uh, of these four million uh, truck and bus drivers uh, that uh, approximately half are tested every year. Is that, uh, is that fairly accurate? The federal requirement is that 50 percent of workers be uh, tested in a given year, yes. So, so, uh, so uh, I'm not sure I understood what you just said. It, it, roughly two million are being tested each year, is that correct? Uh, that is certainly what the requirement is. Um, we have some concerns based well, on our work. maybe what the requirement is, what I'm trying to get at is how, how many do you think are being tested? Uh, uh, I, I'm, my guess is when it comes to motor carriers, it's probably less than 50 percent. Uh, we did find in our work, and FMCSA has told us this, that when they go out and do these safety audits of new, uh, of new companies that are just getting a DOT number and entering into the motor carrier business, that they find that 30 percent of those companies have no drug testing program at all. So there is, my guess, is not less than 50 percent of motor carriers' drivers being tested in any given year. And, and I'm also told that, uh, that roughly 2 percent of the total number of drivers test positive. Of those that are tested and where we uh, where, in fact, the, the test is able to either um, find a positive test or an adulterated test. As Mr. Coots has said and as we have found, we, we think that there is a higher number that are actually successfully substituting or adulterating and not getting caught. So, and is it, uh, is it accurate then that to 40 percent uh, of those who uh, have tested positive go through the return to duty process? Uh, I don't have those numbers uh, in front of me, Mr. Duncan, but I have no doubt to doubt, no reason to doubt what Dr. Smith said. All right. What, uh, Ms. Kutz, uh, what, what is involved in the, in the return to duty process? Do you, in your investigation of all this, do you think the return to duty process is sufficient in, in most instances? We stopped. At, we actually did the tests. And you we didn't stopped. look. No, you we didn't, didn't look into. We that. didn't look at that. Once we got our negative results back, we were done. Uh, Mr. Duncan, I can comment on that if yes, you'd like. Yes, go me right to. ahead. Uh, once a positive test is reported to an employer, uh, the what, what is supposed to happen is the driver is supposed to be removed from that safety sensitive position, and then be allowed to go through this process, which would typically involve education, treatment, and a series of drug tests before being allowed to return to duty. Well, is the main problem here not so much in the number of drivers being tested, but it's, but it's in the fact that it's so easy to falsify or man manipulate these tests? Is that, is that the main problem? I, I would say there were two problems. That is one of them. The other is that there is a fair amount of noncompliance within the motor carrier uh, community itself in terms of actually getting drivers to enroll in this drug testing program at all. Dr. Smith, uh, um, do you feel that uh, the states uh, uh, are being harsh enough on the uh, drivers uh, that they uh, uh, that have these accidents in which drugs uh, are involved? Uh, and um, secondly, um, um, do you feel that uh, uh, do you question this uh, return to duty process? And, and is, your, is your association uh, has it been trying to encourage or, or do something uh, to see that the states do get a little tougher in enforcing? In other words, uh, in our system, the federal government can't do everything. The state and local people have to do some things as well. Mm -hmm. Well, two things I think that um, of note in the six states, and I only have data on three of them, where there is a requirement that either the medical review officer or the employer report DOT violations, such as a positive drug test or a refusal to test where the specimen is adulterated or substituted, and that that information is then put onto that driver's CDL. 
The substance abuse professionals that I have spoke to that operate in those states have seen higher compliance with going through the return to duty process because the driver in the state of Oregon, for example, okay, knows that that positive test is on his CDL record. And so in order for him to work in transportation again, unless he leaves the state and is able to get a CDL elsewhere, is contingent upon him completing the return to duty process that Ms. Sigaroy just mentioned with regard to a substance abuse professional evaluation, completion of education or rehabilitation, and uh, having passed a return to duty, uh, and then being subject to increase intensified monitoring through follow-up testing in addition to taking his or her chances in the random the random pool. Right. So I think that yes, where states have taken the lead, I think that there is an effect. I can't, it's only two states I can judge it on. I don't have a lot of data, Mr. Duncan. All right. Um, one last question, uh, 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 Mr. Coots. Uh, what, what do you think is the best way to uh, stop or discourage this, this cheating or this uh, manipulation of these tests that seems to be going on at this point? Well, if you don't address the actual collection process, which and move towards more of a direct observation, you really have to attack these products because these products are so widespread. It's interesting that one or two percent of the people fail. I'd like to meet those people because it would be hard to imagine someone not being able to beat a test if they were fairly skilled right. in actually bringing synthetic urine. It's not they don't check your socks, for example. So. If you put synthetic urine in your sock, you potentially could beat this test 100% of the time. Well, well, when you say uh, address the collection process or, or get to the products, how do you th how do you think we should go about that? That's the question. How can we how can we stop this uh, cheating? Do you think? Well, certainly, um, with respect to the current process, better uh, adherence to the current protocols would help. We found an average of four to five out of the 16 tests we looked at or of the protocols we looked at were not followed by the site. So right there you have a problem right. with adherence to DOT protocols. With respect to improving that process, again, and I'm not saying this is the right answer, but a direct observation is one certain way to know that you're getting the, the person's urine. There's still potential ways to beat that, but direct observation is certainly a stronger test. And then again, the products at the end of the process are uh, just, it's a proliferation of those products. And again, since there's not a real search of the person going into the site to take the test, it's very easy to hide an adulterant or a synthetic urine to get in. So it, it's really, there's no silver bullet. I think there's a lot of pieces of this that need to be looked at. All right, thank you very much. I thank the ranking member. Uh, I turn now to the chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna thank this panel for a very thoughtful and, and, uh, and in-depth review and, and shocking information that you've provided for us. Mr. Coots. When you got deeply into this uh, investigation and you uh, found these products, uh, Whizzies, Urine Luck, Stealth, how to, and, and guidance on how to pass a drug test, and found those products on Craigslist and eBay and Amazon, what was your gut reaction? Well, I, I wasn't surprised they were out there, but the number of hits you get when you put in, for example, beat drug tests, pass drug tests, it's hundreds of thousands or millions of hits out there. So it's just amazing the number of entities that are out there that are marketing these products. Hundreds of thousands and millions of hits. And telling the, uh, the uh, subscriber or the person checking in on, on the uh, internet this is how you can beat the DOT, flat out telling them how, how, to, how to operate illegally, right? It's the DOT and any other drug test. I mean, it's yeah. much broader than that, but DOT is specified in many of the websites. We'll help you beat the DOT test, guaranteed, 200% money back return, all those kinds of guarantees. And FDA approved, as Mr. DeFazio pointed out there. I saw that wild representation, claim. whether that's true or not. Wild, wild claim, whether it's true or not. Many claims like that, yes. It gets your attention right away. Yes. But others than drivers would be subscribing to those lists, wouldn't they? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, 
Dr. Smith, you, uh, uh, you, you touched on but didn't get deeply into the issue of making the products, the masking products, illegal. Uh, have you, uh, uh, has your organization pursued this matter in any depth? Yes, we have, and, and in you, fact, you, the, you did suggest a drug integrity act, yes, drug that test was, integrity act. That was last introduced as uh, I believe HR 4910 uh, and SAPA did uh, present testimony at a hearing on that particular uh, bill. Uh, my understanding is it went to committee and. Uh, and was not uh, not acted upon or, or did not uh, go any further. Well, that was in the last Congress. Yes, sir. Yeah, and that was uh, in the Committee on Energy and Commerce. That is correct. Uh, we'll, we'll, we, we have that uh, bill test. Uh, uh, staff has, has looked at this Drug Testing uh, uh, Integrity Act. Uh, I have just made a cursory review of it. Uh, we need to look at that in greater depth and we welcome your suggestions as to how we can make it more effective. Uh, we would be happy to provide that because I think it is very essential that we are as comprehensive as possible in the language. If you have something like, for example, if you have language that any product that is solely produced or distributed or sold to defraud a drug test, you will find that suddenly those labels will say, a product suitable for cleaning your fine jewelry, okay, for uh, uh, for making precision instruments operate cleanly and for detoxifying body fluids. So now it simply comes. Now, of course, the product's name may have something clever like Mary Jane Super Clean, wink, wink. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Mary Jane, of course, the code name for marijuana. But so I think it's important that, that there be a lot of thought placed into putting together a piece of legislation that ha can have some effect. And I might also add that I think following what, th uh, there are 15 states now that have some degree of, of legislation in this regard. Some of the most successful ones have been ones where it also makes it a criminal offense, albeit there's a lot of different levels from misdemeanor to whatever, for the person who is caught using a product. So it's really trying to get at the end user as well as the manufacturer, distributor, et cetera. So I would think that that should be something the committee or who would sponsor such a bill should take into account. I'm, I'm glad you elaborated on because you touched on all the follow-up points I was going to raise. <laughs> You're very good. Uh, because once uh, you, you say, oh, okay, this is illegal because it has no other valid uh, societal uh, beneficial use, then some other applic application like it's a good pesticide can be uh, tacked uh, onto it, but and FDA approved. It has to be um, th this this anti-drug effort has to be a multi-layered issue, just like security. Security has to be multi-layered. You cannot do just one thing. You have to have many uh, applications, many aspects to to uh, just as in uh, safety and aviation. Uh, we don't do just one thing. We don't build one uh, practice into an aircraft build many backups, redundancies. So there have to be backups and redundancies in this drug testing. And one of those is to, to make, to go to the origin, make the product uh, illegal. So at, at least there is a, uh, the, there is a way to uh, catch someone doing it and, and, uh, sh and potentially shut them down. And, and then the, the testing, uh, the process of testing, and then the user, and, and then the, the company that's hiring the people. Uh, one of the later uh, 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 testimonies we'll see is a, for, is a, is a uh, suggestion for a, a national clearinghouse. You've suggested a national database, something that I've advocated. There's all, we also have the National Driver Register, uh, which uh, catches over 350,000, 400,000 drivers a year who lose their license in one state, still able to, to uh, get a license or try to get a license in another state. The NDR has cut those people, prevented them from, from getting licenses. I know a little something about that because I authored that legislation 25 years ago. Uh, and we, uh, uh, and aviation uses the NDR now. 
something of this nature and, and maybe expanding the information available through the National Driver Register would be beneficial as well. The only response that I have there is, and, and I'm not an attorney, but having dealt for many years with this with my former colleague from the Department of Transportation, Robert Ashby, there's a difference, or what would have to be adopted, a difference from DOT drug tests, which are administrative, employer, et cetera, as opposed to something that has been adjudicated through the criminal justice system, such as a, a driving under the influence or a driving while intoxicated. So I would agree, and certainly the NTR DR has been extremely effective, in, in my opinion, uh, with how FAA has used it to identify pilots and others who have DWI convictions, yeah. and that that is an indicator of substance abuse or an issue that needs to be dealt with. Um, I, I really do think that it is possible. I know that it will be a cumbersome system because there's got to be some type of uh, avenue for correction to records that are incorrect. There has to be some way to document effectively for the driver who has gone through the return to duty process, has successfully completed rehabilitation, and therefore should be eligible. All of those things are necessary. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Duncan asked, a, I think, a, a key question in this process that we are engaged in, and that is, is the problem that the tests are easy to bypass. And dealing with, and you, you, you don't need to rehash the answer because it was a very good answer and, and, uh, and complete answer, but how do we deal with that? What, uh, Mr. Kutz, I know your, your uh, investigation was aimed at finding the, the issues uh, that, that you raised, the problems that, that you uh, have reported on, but in the process, you and Ms. Sigurud uh, surely have some ideas of how testing can be made more effective. Well, I would say, again, you've mentioned that you have to look at all phases of this program. Yes. From, from, and from our perspective, with the covert testing we did, from the moment you walked in the door till the point in time when the lab actually tested the urine, uh, there were issues with all phases of that. I kind of look at it as three phases. You walked in the door with a counterfeit ID, you were able to get in. You were able to go through the protocols. They didn't follow a lot of protocols. And even if they did, you could substitute the urine or adulterate the urine. And then when you sent it to the laboratories, the lab was unable to detect in the eight cases we did the adulterants or the synthetic urine. So you've got issues even with the laboratories and what kind of testing they're doing and how effective that is. We haven't discussed that yet even. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, driver ID was, <laughs> was, again, shocking, but that's an issue that the uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security is dealing with for a secure uh, identification card for transportation workers. We need to engage them in this process of doing a, a accelerating their uh, development of the TWIC and, and coordinating with other uh, agencies of federal and state government. We have to engage the states in this process as well. Uh, the, uh, and then the next is, is the protocols. Uh, what are your thoughts about, about the uh, presence of an observer in the, the delivery of a sample? Well, again, it gets into the trade-off between privacy and other issues right. and having an effective drug test. Certainly direct observation is going to be a lot harder to beat than actually going into a room and closing the door. Now, we did have one instance where the individual actually made our agent leave the door open, and we still were able to put su substitute synthetic urine into the collection cup and beat the test. So, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult without a direct observation to actually catch someone trying to cheat. Mr. Robustar, if I yes, could, could add to that, uh, I think the thing to keep in mind in expanding in that direction, which would be much more labor intensive than the current approach, of course, is that not only are we talking about motor carriers, but transit workers, rail workers, uh, aviation workers, et cetera, the vast majority of whom are not using drugs. And so uh, having a directly observed observation for people who are are likely not criminals, I think, is a, is a, would be a very big step to take. And could be very hugely labor intensive, no question about it. I, I, I know that. Yeah. But look, in bridge testing, we had testimony just last week, Mr. Uh, DeFazio's hearing on uh, legislation that we reported yesterday on a, on a bridge uh, safety program, that the state of Minnesota has only 77 inspectors for 14,000 bridges. They don't have enough people to, to, to do that job. Imagine trying to to deal with seven 
million drivers uh, in this country. Uh, one, uh, uh, well, we, we need to think this through. Uh, the, the, uh, what about the lab test? Is, w wouldn't that be s something more uh, amenable to management that, uh, that federal and state governments could actually exercise control over the labs that are doing the, the testing? Well, I think HHS does exercise some oversight of the labs, certainly, and again, getting into the issue of whether the labs are actually testing for synthetic urine or dilutants. Right now for this test, the DOT test we did, we don't know whether they were checking for the synthetic urine or the adulterants. They're authorized but not required to. And so that's another thing. And uh, well, We need to close that loophole then. That could be a loophole in addition to yes. what Chairman DeFazio said here with respect to the advertising for these people out there, what actually they're testing for, what kind of things are out there. Uh, that's something that needs to be looked at. That could be a simple fix so that these people who are out there devising products to beat the system don't know everything they need to know. Well, we absolutely have to crack down, I think, on, on that advertising on the Internet, how to beat the, the DOT. That, that's something within our ability to do. If, we're gonna, if, if we have the, the chip to, to, for parents to prevent their kids from being exposed to bad TV, we ought to be able to do something like this. All right, I, I've gone on way too long, but I'm exercised about this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one very quick point. Uh, I believe a lot of the airlines, I've heard complaints from the employees, do direct observation. And so, because you mentioned Ms. Mm -hmm. Seeger and FAA, I, but I think they do. I, no? You're shaking your uh, head? I, I, no? Okay. I, under federal authority, any employer in transportation, whether it's an airline right. or whether it is a motor carrier, is limited to just six very specific circumstances where they can do direct observation. And those, under the regulatory scheme, have been identified as, as you know, instances where the the employee or the candidate has a, a, a lowered expectation of privacy. For example, an a flight attendant who has a positive test and now must undergo follow-up testing, mm -hmm. the airline can do every single one of those follow-up oh. tests under okay. direct observation. All right, so it's sort of a probable cause thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Boustinay will uh, go ahead with uh, his questions now. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we have a doctor here now. I mean, maybe he can help us get yeah. to the bottom of this. <laughs> I, uh, human, human ingenuity is truly amazing, especially when used for devious purposes. Uh, and, and with that having been said, it leads me to doubt whether we can actually uh, truly regulate and eliminate these, the use of adulterants. I, so that, that's going to be a difficult problem. In looking at this, I've, I've sort of broke it down into test integrity and looking at the collection process um, and you know, looking at the, the lab accuracy and, and reporting. Uh, then there are lab compliance and certification issues. What's the role of state versus uh, federal DOT in laying out those kind of guidelines? Uh, reporting database, which you mentioned, uh, federal database, or should the, there be state databases with sharing of information? Um, and then the effectiveness of the return to duty process. I, I guess I have so many questions, it's going to be impossible to ask them all. But uh, um, let start off with the return to duty process. Is that? I mean, how, how really effective is it right now? It is my opinion from, from being in this industry for a number of years that it is minimally effective. I think that the problem that we have of, you know, under the D Department of Transportation regulations, a motor carrier nor any other employer is required to um, give a person an opportunity for rehabilitation, hold their job open, and then monitor their aftercare. And it's my experience that in particularly the motor carrier industry, the majority of trucking, of co of trucking companies where a driver is positive, they terminate them. They fire them on the spot. They are required by the DOT rules to hand them with their pink slip in one hand, in the other hand, by the way, here's the name and address of a qualified substance abuse professional. Go and get the help. But we don't know what happens to them afterwards. And well, and our, our um, information shows that, that clearly less than 40% of those ever follow through with that substance abuse professional referral. And so they leave, they can, some of them can leave the state, 
go get a CDL in another state by just not revealing information. And so we've got major loopholes in, in, in that system or that issue alone. Um, another question, I, I, I am a physician, but I'm not an expert on laboratory science. Is there some general agreement um, on standards used to detect drug use and abuse? Um, you know, combinations of random, random testing with scheduled testing. Is there some general agreement that can give you 90% confidence, 95% confidence, or, or so on? The best data that is probably available on that, it comes from the years of the U.S. military's drug testing program in terms of at what, um, at what percentage, for example, Ms. Sigaroid mentioned that the, the current percentage in the motor carrier industry is 50% random annually. And in terms of looking at a population that you make some assumption of, what percentage random testing gives you the optimal deterrence, for example? Um, what are the odds, if you will, that a person will be found, will be identified on a pre-employment drug test when they have had two or three days notice to clean up and not use drugs and knowing the, de the detection level, et cetera. Those kinds of data are, are available. I can tell you in terms of trying to estimate the scope of the problem, a formula that has long been in place is that if your random testing positive rate is, let's say, 1%, that using urine drug testing with the detection windows available, giving the statistical manipulation, your best estimate is that the actual prevalence of current use is three and a half times that percentage. That's the and, and there are limited studies available, sir. But that's the best that we've been able to do. I thank you. In, in terms of uh, in looking at laboratories and trying to make sure that laboratories are doing all that's necessary with regard to collection standards, um, um, accuracy reporting, and, and so forth, what, uh, what's the role of the state and state DOT versus federal in that? Uh, I mean, typically labs. Uh, and the practice of medicine is sort of a state-regulated issue. Um, could, could you comment on, on, on that interface? Mr. Busini, this, this is a federal program that we're talking about. So uh, the collection sites uh, are expected to follow standards and training established by the federal government. The medical review officers are, again, following, following standards federal established guidelines. by the federal government. The laboratories that test the specimens are regulated by the Department of Health and Human Services. Okay. Um, because clearly, I mean, uh, we're gonna, there, there's going to be a need to try to tighten all that up. Mm -hmm. or, do you, or do you feel that the standards are appropriate, it's just that the laboratories are not following the standards? Uh, I want to make a distinction here between collection sites and laboratories. So right. a lot of the issues we've talked about today have been more on the collection site side and whether those protocols are being followed and whether even when they are, whether they can be subverted. The laboratories then are, are of course, regulated by the Department of Health and Human Services, and um, we have not focused as much on whether there are particular issues there. We have a later witness on that, of course, but Mr. Coots did find that the laboratories were unable to identify some of the adulterated specimens that his investigators submitted. Right. Of the eight specimens we submitted, four of them were in synthetic urine and four were adulterated. Now, we, the urine we adulterated was clean urine, so we don't know whether an adulterant would have actually worked for a drug user but the synthetic urine also produced a negative test result. And we didn't know whether the labs would be able to catch it or not. We weren't sure, certain of that. Okay. So, we, I mean, we need to focus on both sides of it then, the collection side and the, the laboratory yes. accuracy uh, piece. Thank you. That's all I have, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, thank you. We have only uh, seven minutes till the vote. Uh, do you want to do your five minutes now, Grace? Okay. Go ahead. Very quickly, and because uh, I know we're, we have to get out, uh, the uh, test integrity itself is, is questionable, of course, it, since it's, uh, some of it is, is done not in labs, right? Am I correct? So their, their uh, validity is in, in, um, in question. What about employees of the labs? Uh, my, my reading of a staff memo indicates that there's a high turnover. Uh, is there a question? Have you um, validated the uh, sincerity that, how would I say, the, the, the integrity of the employees themselves in the labs? 
I think again, uh, if I can respond to that, that that, it, that comment was intended for the collection sites, these 10,000 doctor's offices, clinics, uh, okay. patient service centers. There are only approximately 57 laboratories that actually do the analysis of the specimens that are certified by the Department of Health and Human Services, but yeah. there are all of these other collection sites where the process begins. But, and there are no penalties for uh, um, the employee who is found with the dirty urine, am I correct? In other words, they can just uh, uh, be referred and uh, hopefully they'll go, like you say, 40% might go. Um, what, what happens, uh, is there a way to be able to make it mandatory referral um, or a penalty if they do not, to be able to uh, keep this employee from not revealing a prior dismissal based on dirty urine, and then go and find another job in having uh, put people in, in, in jeopardy. My concern has been, because I, I have been in an area where the Alameda Quarter has thousands of trucks a day. Many of them come through my district. My concern is the safety of the people and how are those truck drivers able to maintain if they're on amphetamines, and I don't see anything here related to alcohol, just drugs. Uh, Mrs. Napolitano, there is an alcohol program. Uh, we have just really focused our statements today on uh, the drug testing program, uh, and it may be that there are witnesses who can talk more about that, but our focus is on the drug testing. I do, I do want to be clear that for uh, employees that have a positive test, their, their employers are required to immediately remove them from a safety sensitive position. So in other words, they're not allowed to keep driving. And then there is this referral to this rehabilitation and treatment process. I know, but it's, man it's not mandatory, it is voluntary. Uh, the, the, uh, the, re the treatment process is, man is uh, voluntary, that's right. And they may go on and find another job and not refer to their prior employment. In fact, uh, you know, it, it, that appears to be quite common and that and they may go and apply for another job and not ever reveal that they worked at the employer where they had the positive drug test. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll get, uh, stop now so that we can get uh, to the vote, but I'd like to be able to have a second uh, round. Thank you very much. I thank the gentlelady, uh, thank her for uh, using her time so efficiently. Uh, we will now recess the hearing. Uh, there are uh, three votes. We should hopefully be back in uh, about uh, 20 minutes.